Okay, so uh, we're beginning, uh, this is a lesson number 11 in this series. We're getting, we're, we're getting down to the wire to get all these, uh, all these events. I um, want to show you where we are in the, you know, the big picture here. We're entering into the sixth section in our main outline, and that is the last Passover to the crucifixion, until the, uh, the crucifixion. Last week uh, we saw the Lord making His way from the northern um, countryside one final time, does a kind of a pass up north, ministering, teaching, uh, His disciples teaching the people, visiting, and He's working His way down south to the city. Uh, the last scene that we have is at Simon the leper's home with Lazarus and Martha and Mary, along with the apostles, sharing a meal, fellowship meal. And this meal was eaten in Bethany, uh, which we mentioned was only a few miles from Jerusalem. And of course, the powerful enemies that are awaiting Jesus there in Jerusalem at this time. Now, the section we're going to talk about is divided into six days. So we're going to do days. Sunday, April the 2nd, if you go back in the calendar and check the, the calendar, it would have been April the 2nd. So Sunday, April the 2nd, event number 119, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Matthew 21, Mark, Luke, John, all four of them mention this. Now most who came to Jerusalem for Passover were pilgrims and would normally walk to Jerusalem. Jesus, as we know, sends His apostles to get a, a donkey for Him to ride on, as was prophesied in Isaiah 62 and Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Actually, if you look at all of the passages, you'll see that there were two animals. There was the, the mother of the, of the uh, of the colt that he was riding on together. Um, his entry into the city was to show not only his divine messianic role, but also the humility of the Christ. I mean, if a worldly savior was kind of entering the city, the type that the Jews were hoping for, he would not have come on a donkey. He would have come on a horse. He would have made a much more dynamic entrance. And so the crowds, uh, the, the writers say the crowds cry out, Hosanna, which means, O oh, save. Like save to, to save, salvation, O oh, save. A reference in Psalm 118, 25. It was an expression of adoration. Hosanna was an expression of adoration. And so they lay out cloaks and branches as a mark of respect and honor, the crowds were excited. And once he arrives at the temple, however, there's a different reception waiting for him. You know, as he enters the city, there's a tremendous reception, but once he enters the city and goes to the temple, there is no welcoming committee. There is no honor for him. There's no belief from the leaders. And it's at this point in these passages that he mourns over the judgment coming upon the city and the nation because of this. And he returns to Bethany to spend the night. You know, I'm always amazed at how human the activities are. You know, he's got to sleep somewhere. So he, he leaves Bethany, the triumphant entry and all that excitement. He goes back to Bethany, spends the night. Monday, April the 3rd, event number 120. Jesus curses the fig tree and afterwards cleanses the temple. Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19. Now Jesus cursing the fig tree after He had come to it you know, to get fruit. He had seen you know, leaves and so on and so forth from afar and He's hungry and it says He goes to it. There were no figs. The idea was fig trees when, they, when, when, they, when the leaves come out, the figs are supposed to be there, but there were no figs on this one. And this offers um, an opportunity for him to produce what's called a living parable. Remember, we've talked about these living parables, not just a, a parable that's spoken, but a parable that's acted out. And so it's a living parable that reflects 
what has taken place when Jesus came to Jerusalem and His people, but they had nothing to offer Him. There's the parallel. He goes to the fig tree, they have nothing, it has nothing to offer Him. He went to the temple, to Jerusalem. They had nothing to offer to Him. No faith, no praise. Just as the fig tree will wither and die, so will the nation wither and die. A living parable, germane to what is happening at that moment. On His second visit, Jesus chases out the merchants and the animals. I mean, on the same day, the fig tree event is followed by Him going into the city and chasing out the merchants and the animals out of the temple. This was the second time that He did this, and it's significant because the first time that He did it was at the very beginning of His ministry. The second time He does it is at the end of His ministry. And once again, that night, He returns to Bethany. Tuesday, April the 4th, event number 121, He now pronounces the lesson on the withered fig tree. He cursed it the day before, the next day, he gives the lesson. Matthew 21 records that, 21, 22, Mark 11. So Jesus returns to the temple the next day with His disciples and they pass by the cursed fig tree and see that it has completely withered overnight. And Jesus' lesson on this is that with faith all things are possible because they, you know, the apostles remark, look at the, the fig tree, you know, it withered overnight. And you know, I've heard some really, you know, go off on tangents. Why would Jesus destroy a perfectly good tree? You know, you missed the point here. You're missing, you're missing the point. <laughs> Jesus' lesson is that with faith all things are possible. You know, the alteration of nature is not too hard for Him. And that's what happened with the fig tree, the alteration, the alteration of nature, the control of nature, that's not too hard to him. Whether it's withering a tree or casting a mountain into the sea, both are equally possible for him. What's more difficult, to tell a tree you're cursed and overnight it withers, or to say to a mountain, go into the sea? What's more difficult for God? Well, neither. So his point here is what unleashes spiritual power is faith, and if the apostles have faith, they will do even greater things and it's important for him to remind them of this because they're heading into a very dark moment here where their faith is going to be challenged uh, a, great, a great deal. Now we know that they did hang on because later on they saw Jesus resurrected and themselves perform mighty miracles. Uh, they even raised people from the dead. So he says, you'll do greater things than this. Boy, having a tree wither or raising a human being from the dead. That, I think that's something even greater, isn't it? And so they did it. Um, event number 122, Jesus teaches in the temple, continues the flow. You know, they leave Bethany, the tree, the lesson to the tree, and so on and so forth. Matthew 21, uh, 23 uh, to uh, chapter 22, and then Mark 11 and 12. So it was the Passover week and the large crowds are in Jerusalem and Jesus' teachings were, you know, they were bound to stir up the people so the Jewish leaders tried to neutralize Him by confronting Him. When He came triumphantly, no one was there to meet Him. Okay? No one was there to meet Him. The leaders wouldn't even try at that point. But the next day or the day after, now they're going to do it. And they challenge his authority to cast out the money changers. And his reply is to ask them what they believed you know, concerning John. The, you know, they say, what gives you the right to do this? And so he comes back with a question and says, you know, who do you say John the Baptist is? Now you have to remember that these confrontations were staged in front of the crowd so the leaders were sensitive to what the crowds heard. They had to be careful. So as far as John was concerned, if they said he was a prophet, Jesus was asked them, well, why didn't you obey him if you think he was a prophet? And if they rejected John openly, then the crowds would reject them because the crowds believed that John the Baptist was a prophet. And so in the end, they say nothing and they claim ignorance. So they, they come to attack him 
and He neutralizes their attack. They're trying to neutralize Him, He neutralizes them. So when He says to them, you know, He asked them about John the Baptist and so on and so forth, they have nothing to say, so they're silent. And so to this silent response, Jesus tells them three parables. This all happens in the same sequence of events. The first parable is the parable of the two sons. You know, a father asks two sons to do something and one says, yes, I'll do it, but he doesn't do it. And the other one says no at first, but he changes his mind and later on he obeys the father. The point of the parable was to show that the Jewish leaders were charged with a duty that they accepted. They, they were the sons that said, yes, we accept the duty of being leaders and priests and so on teachers. But they didn't fulfill their duty. And those that had previously disobeyed and neglected their duty, the sinners, the Gentiles, would one day obey the Father in their place. That was the parable. It was pointing right at them. They were silent. The second parable is that of the landowner, where wicked vine growers refused to pay their dues to the landowner. They would reject or kill all those who would come to collect the rent, even the landowner's son. And finally, Jesus predicts that the landowner will eventually come and punish them. Again, the target and the meaning is quite obvious to these leaders. Their response to the second parable? Silence. Third parable, the parable of the marriage feast. A king prepares a feast, but none of the guests want to come. They even beat and kill the messengers sent to invite them. The king destroys them, and in order to have the wedding feast for his son, he invites the poor and the homeless to be his guests. He invites them to wear the wedding garments and to enjoy the feast. You have to understand that at that time, when you, when you had a feast, the rich, when they had a feast, they not only provided the food, they also provided the clothing because many people could not, you know, today you, know, you, have, you own three suits or four suits, that's not a big deal, you, I have five pair of pants, I got 16 shirts, you know, that's not the way it was. Maybe not you, Billy, but you know, I'm just kidding. But you know what I'm saying? Today we, we have multiple changes of clothes and we don't find that extraordinary. You know, it's normal, but in those days that was not normal. And so the one who put on the wedding feast, especially a large, elaborate affair, a king, would also provide his guests with appropriate garments to wear. And so in the parable, one of them refuses to wear the offered garment and is cast out. I mean, that person was invited in for free and refused to wear the garment, had the wrong attitude. Of course, these parables were directed at the religious leaders who were being publicly rebuked by Jesus for their disbelief in Him as the Messiah, and as a result, they desired to kill Him even more than before. Now, I mean, their rage had no, no control. Event number 123, Jesus responds to questions. <clears throat> So while he's at the temple, many different groups come to him with questions and challenges. Matthew 22, uh, you know, 15 to 23, and, and uh, 15, excuse me, Matthew 22, 15, all the way to 23, 39, Mark 12, Luke 20, you have all of those things in your notes. Again, the same sequence. You know, they challenge him, he challenges them back, they're silent, he gives the parables, then groups start showing up to begin challenging him with questions. The first group talks to him about taxes, the Pharisees and the Herodians concerning taxes. Because once the priests have failed to destroy his credibility, the Pharisees come along with the Herodians. The Herodians were a group that supported Herod's position as king and feared that Jesus' teachings would upset his delicate hold on power. Herod was not a full Jew, and so many uh, you know, did not respect his position. There were always many plots and insurrections being cooked up, and the Herodians were a group that supported his position, if you wish. 
And so they tried to challenge him by asking him if it was in accordance with God's law to pay taxes to Caesar. There's a loaded question. The tax they're talking about was the poll tax. It was especially unpopular. It was taken, by, it was taken of the Jews, it was collected among the Jews um, to demonstrate their status as being under Roman authority. The Romans collected it, you know, it was a head tax. You belong to us, you, you pay. There was, they got nothing for it. You stayed alive. <laughs> you stayed alive. So they said, should we pay this as Jews? So of course, if Jesus said yes, he would alienate his followers who hated Roman authority. If he said, and, and who were thinking he was the great savior. Many of them were thinking, hey, this, this, this leader of ours here is going to take the yoke off of our necks and we'll be free from Rome. So that was a really tricky question. If he said no, then of course they'd accuse him of insurrection and they'd charge him in front of the Roman authorities. So Jim, Jesus simply answers that the tax belongs to Caesar. His face was on the coinage and giving it to him was no offense to God because it belonged to him. But the Lord clarified that what belonged to God must also be rendered unto him as well. And here Jesus implies that what belongs to God should not be given to Caesar and vice versa. Sometimes we don't see that point. Yeah, render unto Caesar what Caesar's, render unto God what's God, but don't give to Caesar what belongs to God. Which set the limits of where human government leaves off and divine authority uh, const, uh, continues. Yes, you can give to Caesar so long as Caesar doesn't encroach on God's authority. So the next group to come along are the Sadducees concerning resurrection. The first question was political in nature, the next is theological in nature. Now the Sadducees were the priests. They did not believe in the resurrection or angels. They rejected miracles. They did not accept the books of prophets as authoritative. Only the Pentateuch, they only saw the Pentateuch as being authoritative. The Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Imagine. These were the leaders, these were the priests offering sacrifice. They didn't believe in the prophets. They, didn't, they, they believed that the prophets existed, but they didn't believe the prophets had authority. They didn't believe miracles or angels. They didn't believe in the afterlife or that there would be a conscious afterlife. So they give Jesus a foolish story about seven brothers marrying the same woman after each one of them dies and they ask Jesus, which man's wife will she be in heaven? Now the question was meant to mock the idea of resurrection. It wasn't a serious question. They were just, they, they tried mockery. They tried, you know, to make him look like a fool, to try to answer such a, a dilemma. So Jesus shows that their disbelief and their errors were based on the misunderstanding of the very text that they accepted. He showed that in Exodus chapter three, verse six, remember Exodus, Genesis, Exodus, that was within the Pentateuch, that was their, you know, their authority. He shows that in Exodus chapter three, verse six, God referred to Himself as the one who cared for men who were long dead. He said in this context, in Genesis, he says, I, God says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So this meant that they continued to exist before him in some form, because if I am the God of Jacob and Abraham and so on and so forth, they exist because God is existing. And this proved the concept of life after death from their own text. He also gives them an insight that only God would know, that men do not have wives in heaven because they are like angels in nature. They're spiritual in nature. And the reason that there are no wives in heaven and no marriage in heaven is because there's no death in heaven. If there's no death, there's no need to reproduce life. Not only does he answer their question on their own terms, but he also reveals their ignorance in doing so. And so he dispatches the 
um, the Sadducees. The next group comes with a question concerning the law. These are the rabbis, these are the teachers, the lawyers, if you wish. And um, uh, they ask him about the Shema. Uh, pious Jews repeated the Shema, Deut Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four and five, and it goes like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And they often repeated this phrase. When a lawyer asks Jesus what the greatest commandment is, you know, what is the greatest commandment, the Lord simply repeats the Shema, or a short form of it. But he adds to this comparison a verse in Leviticus 19.18 which says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, and he puts these two ideas together and he says, this is the, this is the greatest command. And he does this to show that uh, 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 to show that love to God is not only demonstrated in ceremony and temple worship, which was important, but in a very real way it's acted out as love towards other people. You cannot love God, what does John say? You can't love God that you can't see and hate your brother that you do see. So it's a very old principle and Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, uh, demonstrates that. And, and interestingly here the lawyer agrees with Jesus and the Lord tells him that he's not far from the kingdom. And what is really missing of course is what? Well, faith in Jesus as the Messiah. He had an understanding of the old law, really what it meant, the heart of it, but he hadn't quite gotten to the fulfillment of that and that is Jesus coming as the Messiah. So now he's kind of, you know, he's taken care of all the groups, the Sadducees, the Herodians, the, Pha the Pharisees, the lawyers, you know, he's taken care of all of them. And so this time Jesus asks them a question. So after they've taken their best shots, he asks them a question concerning the scriptures and what they had to teach about the Messiah, because that was the problem here. If they could accept that He was the Messiah, they wouldn't be asking these questions. They would be like the people who were you know, excited about His coming to Jerusalem the day before. Hosanna. Praise God. And so their concept of the Messiah was that He would be a, a descendant of the great King David and much like David would bring the nation you know, the Jewish nation to political and economic greatness. That's what they were waiting for. And Jesus corrects this view by showing them from the scripture that David himself, the great king, described the Messiah as a divine being coming in the form of a man through David's lineage. Psalm 110.1, David says, the Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, so the Jews understood the implications of this, that Jesus was claiming not only to be the Messiah, but to be a divine Messiah. If the Lord says to my Lord, what does that make Him? And so all were silenced, no one said another word. And in this sequence of events, Jesus gives a last warning. Once he's finished teaching and responding to them, Jesus makes a scathing rebuke to the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes that have attacked him. He reviles them for their pride, you know, because he says, you want the honor of men instead of the honor of God. He reviles them for their hypocrisy. They don't do what they teach others, what others ought to do. He reviles them for their legalism, no grace of God in their teachings, their disbelief. He says they killed the prophets that were sent by God. And he condemns them and mourns over the city that has rejected him and because of this will suffer destruction. All of this, been a long day. And so there's like this interesting little event that just happens right after this tremendous clash. This will be the last time they're going to clash. One little event that pops up, number 124, the widow's offering, right here. After all of these great men 
have challenged him on theology and, and the law and, 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 and the law of the land and so on and so forth. Here comes the widow, Mark 12 and Luke 21. And the point here is that not all Jews were like the leaders, greedy, unbelieving, proud, Jesus commends the love and the generosity of a poor widow who gives all she had as an offering in order to show her faith and her trust in God. And this scene is described to show the tremendous difference between the humble and the acceptable servant of God who had little but gave, and those rejected by God who were given so much but returned nothing. I just find it so amazing that this, just this little passage here fits right there as a juxtaposition to all the other stuff that has just gone by. So next we see, again, the same sequence. Uh, Greeks that desire to see Jesus. There are people all around him. He's, he's confronting one side and the other. He's talking to one and the other. He turns and makes a comment about the, the widow. Then one of his apostles comes to tell him there are some that want to see him. And this is the final group to seek out Jesus. They were Greek converts to Judaism, proselytes, who had very little respect among the Jews. Remember, they were the ones who were in the court of the Gentiles. They were the ones, you know, the tables, you know, the, 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 they were setting up the animals and the money tables and everything in the court of these people right here. And I'm, I'm only wondering, it's only my opinion, I wonder why they wanted to see him. They, he, was the, he was the one that cleared out the area where they were supposed to worship. Perhaps that may have been the impetus for them to, to see him, to be close to him. Their eagerness to see and hear him prompts Jesus to offer a prayer. We don't know what he said to them. It just prompts him, moves him to pray. And in this prayer he predicts his death again and the fruit that it will bear as He is resurrected. And He hears a voice from heaven answering His prayer to glorify the Father's name. And He encourages the crowd to believe and He warns them of the consequences for not believing. Isn't it amazing that the enthusiasm of these proselytes is the thing that moves Him to pray and declare His death and resurrection and declare His Messiahship and so on and so forth. All these other Jewish leaders simply you know, provoked his wrath, provoked his, you know, his, his judgment. So after addressing the general crowd, he leaves the temple area once again. Event number 126. Jesus prophesies concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. Long passages in Matthew 24, 1 to 42. Mark 13, 137, Luke 21, five to 36. So he's been among the crowd, he's faced the different groups, it's been quite an eventful day. And so Jesus brings Peter and James and John and Andrew with him outside the city to teach them about the things that are about to take place. And in these very long passages, Jesus talks about an event in the near future as well as an event in the distant future which would be the end of the world and His second coming. The, uh, the near event, of course, was the destruction of Jerusalem. The far event would be the, uh, would be the end of the world. Now, we don't have time, obviously, to dissect the, these long passages, but these, I'm sorry, something wrong? Okay. Okay. We don't have time to dissect these, um, these long passages, but they do cause us a lot of questions about them because they're complicated. You got everything? Okay. <clears throat> now, there are, so, there are many who interpret these passages as exclusively being the end of the world scenarios. However, Jesus specifically mentions that these things would happen to the present generation. Matthew 24, verse 30. These are things that are going to, you know, this generation will not pass, he says, until these things happen. And so sometimes we're a little confused about these, this, this long passage in Matthew. We need to understand that the passage is talked about from three historical points of view 
at the same time. First of all, there's a panorama of world history that includes the present time when Jesus is speaking right now, the near future referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and then the end of the world at Jesus' return uh, in verses four to 14. So he talks about all these things that, at once. Some people say, oh no, he's only talking about the end of the world, but if he's talking about the end of the world, why would he say, you know, if you're up on a rooftop, don't go back down. If it's in the winter, oh, woe, woe is you if it's in the winter, or woe is you if, if you're nursing a baby. What difference would that possibly make if that would be the end of the world? If it's the end of the world, it doesn't matter where you are. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's winter or summer. It's the end of the world, folks. But if it's 70 AD, when the Romans surrounding, are surrounding Jerusalem, and laying siege to the city, and you need to, you know, there's a, there's a special moment where you need to get out of the city before it's destroyed, then it'll make a difference if it's in the winter or in the summer, because it'll be a lot more difficult to get out in the winter. And then it'll make a difference if you're a mother nursing a child, because if you have to escape the city while nursing a child, that's going to be problematic. See what I'm saying? So the panoramic view, he talks about it from an overall view. Now, the near future 70 AD and the end of the world. Then he telescopes in to 70 AD. He gets specific. In verses 15 to 35, he talks about events that will lead to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. When you see the vultures flying around, when you see the signs, there will be signs, he said, that mark or that point to the, to the, uh, to the end of the city. And then he telescopes again, but this time to the end of the world. And he talks about his second coming at the end of the world. And all of this is done to prepare his disciples for the, you know, he wants to prepare them for the very near future. He's about to be killed. And then he wants to assure them that he'll be resurrected. Have faith, you know, the, 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 the tree, you know, have faith. Then he wants to prepare them for something that's in the not too distant future, 70 AD. Again, their teaching, their attitude, the way that they will have to protect the church when that happens, they need to be ready. They need to be warned about that because it's going to happen in their lifetime. This generation will not pass until this thing happens. And then he has to talk about the second coming when he will return, when nobody knows. Nobody knows that, but it's going to be in the distant future. And they, as apostles, need to understand that idea and know the difference so that they can teach the church. And when we read about, when we read Peter's writings and so on and so forth, we see that you know, he understood what was going on. So all of this is done to prepare his disciples for the future and the events that will take place in the future, and he does this in a very economic way in, a pa in one passage, no big long book, one passage. All right, number 127, the last parable spoken, Matthew 24. So having given his final teachings and warnings to the Jews and preparation to his apostles concerning the end of the Jewish state and the end of the world, Jesus goes on to tell, uh, to tell them parables concerning the people. And the five parables that he gives here in this section, the good men in the house, the wise and the evil servants, the ten virgins and their, their lamps, the parable of the talents, and the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know, the sheep will, be, sheep will be on one side, the goats will be on the other, you know, the end of the world, the judgment. All of these parables have a similar theme, that one does not know when the judgment is coming, but you need to be ready at all times for the final judgment. All these parables, you know, they, they, they form a cap at the end of the day, boom. All right, and that's the end of the day. Wednesday, April the 5th. As the sun sets, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives teaching and preparing His apostles for what is to come. Officially, the next day begins after this 
and so as the following day emerges, we see the Lord continuing to teach and train His apostles. We begin with, uh, well, we don't begin, but the next event is Judas plots to betray Jesus, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 12. Of course, after their stinging rebuke, the Jewish leaders agree to plot to kill Jesus as soon as the Passover is complete in order to avoid a riot. Now, they've wanted to kill him, they've desired to kill him, but now they set a timetable. He needs to die after the Passover. Now it's a firm thing, it's on the calendar. <laughs> We're putting it on the calendar, it's on our to-do list. We're going to do this, and now they're searching for ways. The plot is afoot. Judas plays into their hands by coming to, they didn't have to go looking, he comes to them at this precise moment with a plan to betray the Lord, and they agree to pay him. And in the meantime, the writers say that the crowds are still undecided as to who they believe Jesus was. Many leaders also, not all the leaders, but many of them believed but were afraid to acknowledge who Jesus was because, because they were afraid of being put out of the temple, put out of their jobs. Jesus pronounces judgment on all of these by saying that His words will judge them in the end, meaning how they reacted to His teaching will be the criteria for judgment. And that's the final event that we're going to talk about today. Two lessons here before we finish tonight. There will be an end. The Jews refused to believe that there would be an end to their nation, that there would be an end to life as they knew it. And Jesus predicted that there would be an end. He told them. And they didn't believe Him. And they were terribly and tragically mistaken. They didn't believe Him. He said, it's coming. They didn't believe Him. Now we need to realize that Jesus has also predicted the end of our world as we know it and how we need to be ready for it. So my, my, my encouragement is let's learn from their mistake and believe Jesus when He warns us about this, that there will be an end to our world as we know it. We don't know when, and our job is not to know when. Our job is simply to be prepared for that. Second lesson is His word will judge. Parents will not judge. It doesn't matter. Some people say, well, I don't know if I can be, you know, I mean, everybody's here is a member of the church. You know, how many times have you heard, you know, Billy, you study with somebody and say, well, I don't know, boy, I think my grandfather who was a, I don't know, was a Buddhist or something, be rolling over in his grave if I ever confess Christ. You know, well, I'll tell you something. Your parents are not going to judge you. They may be judging you, you know, in this world. <laughs> you're too tall, you're too short, you know, you, whatever. They may judge you in this world, but they're not going to judge you in the next. And the law will not judge you. And your conscience will not judge you. The final judge will be the New Testament. How we react to Jesus' word, word rather, will determine what happens to us in the end. The sheep will be the ones who follow Jesus' words. The goats will be the ones who didn't think they were important or worth believing or obeying. You know, our Bible study tonight is not simply an exercise in learning. It is that, but it's not just that. It's also an act of preparation for that time that we believe is, is coming.